Hi Cherry Pies, today I'm going to tackle a subject that I have been thinking of talking about on the channel for a while because it just keeps coming into my mind. I was going to do a Q&A video today and I have filmed some of it, um, but I'm trying to decide how much I can get away with doing in one video because there were quite a few questions this time. So I thought to myself, I want to upload a video today because I want to let everybody know who the Self Love September subscriber giveaway winners are. You will see them um, below, somewhere now, underneath me. Well done you two, and uh, I'll also put the results back on the original giveaway video and announce that it has now closed. Um, so that was that was tons of fun, I was really excited to see who won as well. Um, so yeah, so I wanted to put a video out today to make sure that people knew who the subscriber giveaway winners were, and I kind of thought to myself, rather than do it, rather than do it in a Q&A, because I can't really decide kind of whether or not to do two parts or you know how to how to do it because I do want to answer all the questions I don't feel that there are so many questions at this point in my YouTube life that I can't answer them all um, but it's a bit fiddly to, to answer them all so I thought I'll talk about imposter syndrome because it's something that's been coming up and something that I feel intuitively called to talk about over and over again and I've just not gotten around to it so Many of you watching this video will probably already have a fairly good idea of what imposter syndrome is, if not um, direct experience with imposter syndrome. And that's basically where you feel like a fraud, you feel like a phony, um, even though you can kind of logically tell yourself that you're good at whatever it is you do for a living, or you're worthy of your kind of creative passion, or you know, you are legitimate on your pathway in life, there's this insidious underlying fear that you are a phony, that you're a fake, that you're a fraud, and that it's only a matter of time before people find out your dirty little secret and come to know that you are not as good as they think you are or you don't know as much as they think you do. And at that point, there's going to be horror, there's going to be catastrophe, your life is going to come tumbling down. And as you can imagine, and for anyone who's been through it, you know from direct experience that imposter syndrome is super insidious, really, really difficult to live with, and it does affect a lot of the decisions you make in life and a lot of the actions that you take in life. Some people can find themselves completely controlled by this underlying pervasive sense that they are a fake, that they are somehow pretending, that they are just acting at being an adult, or just acting at being an academic, or just acting at being a parent, or just acting at being a writer, or an art artist, or you know, anything like that. So it can af affect different people in, in all different walks of life, but when it gets under your skin and it starts to become pervasive, it can be intensely difficult to shake off and it's only really when you acknowledge that you are dealing with a case of imposter syndrome that you can start to kind of move in the right direction and you can um, put steps in place to make sure that you are not kind of being eaten alive by it and you're not allowing it to affect your decisions and you're not allowing it to affect your actions. I wrote a list of some of the, the key kind of signs that I would say would potentially be indicative of somebody having imposter syndrome so that you can have a chance to understand if you actually fit the criteria and if you struggle with imposter syndrome either in one aspect of your life or across several aspects of your life. So the first thing that I wrote was a fear of failure and or success and obviously this would have to come into alignment with other signs of imposter syndrome but I think it's fair to say that most people who feel like a fraud or like a phony in some way are either terribly afraid of failing and disappointing people and not living up to their own or other people's expectations or they're really afraid of the expectation that people have that they are going to succeed, that they are going to do great things. They're afraid of owning their potential, so they're afraid actually of their success. Um, and, and both of these things can apply for different people at different times. Toxic comparison is a major one, um, a massive way that people with imposter syndrome hit themselves over the head time after time is through comparing themselves to others who they will see as the real deal. So if you have imposter syndrome, you're quite likely to look at somebody else in your field or somebody else doing the same thing as you, and you will see them as the real deal. You will see them as the person who is not phony and who is not fake. You might see them as the person who has a perfect life or, you know, bakes the perfect cake or is the perfect parent. Or again, you know, it, it kind of varies from person to person, but you will quite often hold them to a very lofty height. You will put them on a pedestal and you will beat yourself over the head with how amazing they are in comparison to you. 
If you have imposter syndrome, you're likely to live with this weird fear of being discovered. So it's almost like you've done something wrong or you're every day kind of doing something wrong and you're, you're, you fear somebody finding out that you lack the amount of knowledge that they think you do or that you lack the amount of compassion that they think you do. You know, whatever it is that you're attempting to live up to, you're constantly afraid that the, the veil is going to be pulled away, you know, and they're going to see that man behind the curtain and that's something that you really fear you probably find that praise makes you fear people's expectations. So even when you are being externally validated through being praised by somebody, that still kind of feeds into your imposter syndrome quite a lot because you then feel that there's this high expectation placed on you that you are only gonna fall short of. You fear that again, you know, the curtain is gonna be pulled back to reveal that you're just an ordinary human being that's just as flawed as everybody else. And so you kind of feel like praise piles that pressure on. It's also highly likely that you attribute most of your successes to external things such as luck. You know, you might say something like, oh, you know, it was nothing to do with my talent. I was just in the right place at the right time kind of thing. So you're constantly deflecting praise because praise makes you panic. So it's almost like you go after praise and validation and accolades and all the rest of it. But once you get it, it only adds to the problem because nothing external will help you to deal with the problem of imposter syndrome. The answer has to come from within. The release and the healing has to come from within. So when you receive the praise that you're convinced that you actually desire, it just piles the pressure on, it makes you feel like even more of a fraud, and you kind of deflect the praise at that point. It's highly likely that you are very, very good at remembering all the times that you failed, and pretty crappy at remembering all the times that you succeeded. Um, you, you probably find it quite difficult to recall your accomplishments, to speak about your accomplishments, or to consciously acknowledge your accomplishments, but when it comes to your failures, your setbacks, the times when you didn't do so well, you know, the embarrassing times, the times where you fell over your words, or something didn't come out how you wanted it to, you can definitely recall those times without doubt. People with imposter syndrome usually use their emotions to reason things out. So they'll use their very subjective sense of what's going on in order to kind of create what they see as an objective truth. So for example, if they feel that they are really stupid and if they feel that they are really inferior, then that equates immediately with the truth that they must be really stupid and they must be inferior. So people with imposter syndrome, when it starts to kick in and when it starts to come into action, um, find it very difficult to distinguish between what they feel and what is really the case. The last thing I want to mention with regard to imposter syndrome that a lot of people that kind of deal with it actually find themselves doing is creating these really abstract, unhelpful, bullshit rules for themselves that they then kind of force themselves to um, maintain and adhere to. Even when they're really silly, like for example one rule could be, I must not ask for help. Like, asking for help is a sign of weakness, so I can't ask for help. There are so many little rules that we set for ourselves with regard to kind of what we think we should shape our core personality to be. And I think with imposter syndrome, those little unhelpful rules, those abstract kind of conditions that we set for ourselves, like I can't ask for help or I can't show weakness or, you know, crying is, is, is a sign of weakness or I can't stop even when I'm really tired, you know, like um, I think that these silly unhelpful rules that really kind of beat us over the head, they become even more... Um, pervasive and yucky and they really kind of do their work to ruin your life because if you're convinced that you're an imposter and if you're convinced that it's only a matter of time before people discover this evil little fact about you then of course you're going to work three times four times as hard to maintain those shitty little unhelpful abstract rules. There are tons of incredibly impressive people who have admitted to dealing with imposter syndrome. Uh, Maya Angelou is a very famous one. Um, she said something like, you know, I've written 11 books and every single time I finish a book, I think to myself, you know, I, people are going to find out I'm running a game on them. People are going to discover that I'm not who I say I am. You know, people are going to realise that I've lied all this time, that I'm not this writer. Which, if you think about it, that explains a great deal. You know, if you know anything about Maya Angelou, if you've written, read anything by her, you'll realise immediately that imposter syndrome is not a sign that you're a failure, and imposter syndrome is not a sign that you're fake, because Maya Angelou was neither of those things. Kate Winslet is also somebody who very famously said, and there are loads of other examples, but Kate Winslet said that when she... For a long time, when she became like this big, popular, world famous actress, she would go to the set every single day feeling like a fraud, like a fake, like somebody who had to pretend she was an actress but wasn't really. And this is something that a great many people who are very accomplished and very successful talk about. 
um, in all walks of life, in all industries, among all kind of artistic professions and otherwise. There have even been some studies done that have proved that people in um, areas like medicine and law who lowered their vocation, so changed their course to do something that wasn't quite as demanding or wasn't quite as high profile, um, publicly said that they were doing that because they wanted to make sure they could spend more time with their family or have more free time. But privately when they were asked, they actually admitted that it was because of feelings related to imposter syndrome. It was because of this feeling that they could never live up to um, what it was that they wanted to pursue, that they could never measure up to the other people on the course you know they were intimidated and they felt like it would be fraudulent to go ahead and do that higher vocation and, and have that higher profession. It's also worth noting that whilst men and women do deal with imposter syndrome women are particularly susceptible to it for all kinds of obvious reasons that I could get into but won't right now but studies uh, increasingly and consistently show that women do struggle a lot with imposter syndrome and they will be more than likely um, more commonly the people that will kind of um, attribute all of their success to outside external factors that had nothing to do with them. It was just luck, I was in the right place at the right time, all that kind of thing. And they are far less likely than men to attribute their success to their hard work, their grit, their commitment and their intelligence. So, like I was saying, there are tons of people that are very accomplished, very respected, who have said that they have suffered with imposter syndrome. And that goes to show that you're in really good company if you also suffer with imposter syndrome, and it's therein obviously not a sign that you are fraudulent, or that you are in some sense pretending. It's how you react to this feeling that counts. I think that's the most important thing. It's not the fact that you're feeling those feelings, because you need to know that plenty of people are feeling those feelings, but it's how you choose to react to the feelings that counts. It's what you choose to do with that feeling. Do you let it stop you? I've got a quote here from Pacific Standard Magazine, and it says, For many people, imposter syndrome is a natural symptom of gaining expertise. So basically the insinuation here is that the better you get at something, the more time and focus you invest into something, the more likely it is that you're going to feel that you are in some sense a fraud or an imposter. So that's quite interesting, you know, and that goes kind of across all kinds of people in all different industries and walks of life, that feeling that you are in some sense pretending. And I think this comes from a few things. Firstly, the more accomplished you become at something and the more you walk your walk and talk your talk, and become more focused and get more results, the more you're probably going to be rubbing shoulders with other people who are doing a similar thing and who are also trying to be movers and shakers in some way. And it's likely that you're going to be spending more time around people who are like, you know, full of energy, full of passion or very intelligent or whatever it is. And so for those, you know, that deal with things like toxic comparison, you know, that habit of, of kind of fixating on how somebody else is better in ways that you're not, the more that you kind of excel at whatever it is you're doing, the more you have your pick of the bunch with regard to who you're going to toxically compare yourself to on a given day. You know, you just have more people around you that you would be able to kind of sink your teeth into with regard to toxic comparison. You will measure yourself up against those people and it will all go very wrong very quickly. It's also obvious that anybody who wants to commit to something and put their focus and their passion into something is obviously ambitious and tenacious to an extent. And it's kind of really important to look at where ambition might be unrealistic. Um, the more you go into your craft, dedicate yourself to what you're doing, get promoted up a certain ladder in a career that you love, anything like that, the more that you focus on improving yourself and pushing yourself, the more that imposter syndrome might leak in if your sense of what you're actually going towards isn't realistic. And remember, it's okay to have lofty dreams, but it's not okay to focus on them all the time in their entire Entirety. I always often say that the overarching goal is a little bit like the sun. If you look at it all the time, you will just go blind or at the very least you'll get a massive fucking headache. It's not what you want to be looking at. You want to make sure that your overarching goal is there in the background to inspire you and to give you that sense of light to push you forward. But you want to make sure that your overarching goal has a ladder reaching down from it to you and the ladder is made of little rungs which are manageable 
aims. They are manageable, actionable tasks that you can tick off one by one. And so instead of looking at the sum, which is the overarching goal all the time, you want to be looking at each separate rung on the ladder, which is the next right action, the next move, the next thing that you need to do to move you closer to the overarching goal. So that's something that I would say is that anybody that is tenacious in a certain way or is going after a certain thing is probably a very ambitious person at heart. And some of the imposter syndrome could be leaking in because the ambition is taking over and the overarching goal is kind of becoming a fixation, you know, it's becoming obsessive. Um, and so maybe it's, it's time to kind of um, look at splitting it up into manageable aims and that can be a good way to deal with imposter syndrome. So yeah, definitely just make sure that the bar is set at a realistic level and that you're not doing your head in with trying to be Superman or Superwoman every day because you're not magnanimous. A lot of people say that they really struggle to own their successes and this is a big part of imposter syndrome. Like I said before, it's very easy to highlight your failures and take ownership of your failures if you have imposter syndrome because they back up the toxic little narrative that is constantly going on in your mind, that you're fake, that you're a fraud, that you're not worthy of your success, that you're not worthy of your happiness or your sense of accomplishment accomplishment. So obviously you're going to prop up that toxic little story by highlighting the failures and by highlighting the negative whilst you simultaneously give all of the kind of the praise and the accolades for the good stuff that you've done to things like blind luck and chance and you know I was just fortunate or whatever it is. But minimising your successes does nothing to serve you or anybody else. If you are shining your light and you're taking ownership of what you've done to achieve what you've achieved, then you're giving other people permission to do the same thing in their own lives. And I know that this has been true for me. I know that the people who gave themselves permission to own their potential and shine in the world were the people who inspired me to be my best and to get up and to start my life again. And I know that now that I allow myself to shine and I allow myself to be in the seat of my power, that I now pay it forward and inspire other people to do the same thing. So I just, I think it's, it's about sitting with yourself and it's not an easy mindset change. It's really not. It doesn't come at the flick of a switch and anyone who's looking for that is going to be sorely disappointed but it's it is a mindset change that's possible sit with yourself and just think to yourself how is it serving you or anybody else when you minimize your successes or when you don't take ownership of the wonderful things that you've done when you don't take ownership for the ways in which you're striving to do great things how is it giving back to the planet, how is it serving you, how is it filling up your heart or anybody else's heart to minimise your successes or disown your accomplishments? How is that working out for you basically is the question that I would ask and you know the honest answer that you're going to give to yourself is it's not working out well for you or anyone else, it's not a healthy way to live life. Give yourself loving words every morning, you know? I really think if you suffer with imposter syndrome and you know it, then you should be taking that little moment in the shower in the morning or when you're eating your breakfast when you actually just check in with yourself, give yourself a little hug and say to yourself, I'm going to have a good day today because I sure as shit can't be anybody else, but nobody else can be me either. I'm the only one of me in the world and that is going to be enough. Today that is going to be enough. You know, just have that little moment with yourself. It doesn't take much, but it really fuels you and fills you up because you have to remember your intention not to succumb to imposter syndrome. You have to bring it to consciousness. This is not something that just goes on by osmosis while you're asleep. You've got to put the work in, you've got to take the ownership for seeing where your imposter syndrome is coming in and, and screwing things up for you. And you've got to really lay the strong foundations every day. And like I said, it doesn't take very long and it doesn't take anything out of you. It gives your day so much more moxie, so much more guts and dance and gumption and va va voom if you do that. You know, it's a very small thing, but it makes a very big difference. It's turning the dial ever so slightly, but it makes all the difference in the world. Here's something that I want to ask you with regard to imposter syndrome. And this is something that I've asked clients before and I've asked friends before and I've asked myself before when I've dealt with imposter syndrome. Who is this perfect person? Who is this perfect person? Where is this perfect person that you think you ought to be? Who is this person that's got it all figured out, that never has any problems, that never has a bad day, that knows everything that they need to know about the subject that they're interested in or the subject that they teach or the industry that they're involved with? Who is this person who never has any insecurity, who's always immaculately turned out, who doesn't have any problems, who is the most intelligent that they can be and the most compassionate and caring that they can be and has no shit to sort out? Because when you, when you see that, 
in somebody, when you project that crap onto somebody, you're depersonalizing them and you're making it really difficult for yourself too. There is no perfect person. There is no one that has it all figured out. There is nobody that has all the answers. We are all winging it. We are all winging it. And we're having our high points and we're having our low points and it's all magic, but essentially, you know, we're all just winging it. We're all just trying to play the game and, and see what happens and experiment and evolve. And we will fall down and we will have to pick ourselves up, dust ourselves off and pat ourselves on the back and, and go again for another round. That's how it is. There's no secret club that you haven't been invited into. There's no secret club of perfect people. And if this is something that's really resonating with you, please click below to the link that I've left in the down bar to my latest blog post, which is more about the toxic comparison end of things. Because this is a blog post that I've written really, really from a heart-centered place about the dangers of toxic comparison. And it's designed to be kind of a little wake-up call just to shake some of these things to the surface and and get you to think through them and to allow you to sit with them and spend that time with them because toxic comparison is just it's just gnarly it's gnarly it's really pervasive for people that have imposter syndrome you are looking up to people shining a light on people putting people on a pedestal that you are convinced are somehow just worlds away from you and where you are and those thoughts that you're having they are not true they are a totally false narrative and most of the time you just use that narrative to keep you safe and to keep you small so that you don't have to take any risks and you don't have to try to move things to the next level in your life you're beating yourself over the head with that story and that story isn't even true it's a fairy tale you know and it's got to come to the point where you know that you're at an impasse and you have to deal with that one of the ways in which I think that we could all potentially help ourselves and other people to lessen the impact of imposter syndrome and to make sure that we labour under it less in life is to be honest about it, to start talking about it, to have real conversations about the feelings that we have, of toxic comparison, of not being good enough, of labouring under a false ideal, of trying to live up to an impossibly high expectation. Let's have these discussions, let's get this stuff out on the table. Because I think a lot of people just feel that they're suffering alone and they feel that they don't actually have permission to be honest with themselves about how they feel. I think a lot of people particularly who are looking up to somebody and kind of looking in awe at somebody and comparing themselves against that person, they don't see that person as somebody who has imposter syndrome, but you can bet your bottom dollar that that person has insecurities, that person sometimes feels fraudulent inside, that person sometimes deals with the same sorts of things. I think it would be good for those who have accomplished a lot in any field or have overcome massive personal challenges, have overcome illness or tragedy, you know, or gotten a PhD or written a book or won a medal of some kind or whatever it is, you know, I think we've all had accomplishments in life that somebody else can look up to and take inspiration from. And so I think it'd be really great if we all could just talk about the insecurities that we've dealt with and the weird little feelings of, you know, fraudulence and not being good enough, you know, because I think a lot of the time we look at somebody that we've placed onto a pedestal and we imagine that they don't have those feelings and that's actually untrue and the more that we actually get rid of the smoke and mirrors around things like admiration and aspiration and all that kind of stuff and the more we start to see each other as just plain and simple human beings with shit to sort out with stuff to work on with insecurities with dark little places inside the psyche where weird stuff is crawling around the more we start to see each other that way the more that we can really love each other honestly and appreciate each other honestly from that purer place, you know? So I would urge you to talk about your issues with imposter syndrome, have a conversation with a friend about it. If you notice that issues like toxic comparison come up um, between family members or in your friendship group or um, in any kind of online context or forum, get involved if you feel that you can get involved. Have your say, be honest about how it's been for you. Maybe if you feel that you've overcome quite a lot of your imposter syndrome and you've found ways to deal with it, share those tactics, don't be silent, speak up, let the people know, let the people know what you know shine that light out in the world we can all learn from each other when it comes to this stuff we really can and you know I think it's also important to have these conversations with children obviously not using some of the psycho spiritual language that we bandy about as adults 
but children feel these kinds of things too you know children deal with comparison sometimes and they deal with feelings of not being good enough and so if we can open up those dialogues for them then in turn they will grow up to be more emotionally intelligent and they will feel more bold and confident about having these kinds of conversations so for me I just feel that it's about honesty and it's about transparency because so many people are walking around convincing themselves that other people don't feel this way and that isn't true other people do feel this way I feel this way sometimes and I think it's just okay to be honest about that and I think that's where the greatest amount of empowerment does come from. I hope this has been helpful. So much love guys, blessed be.